I often think back to my first experience with Monster Hunter back in 2006 when Monster Hunter Freedom was released. I would have been about 13 at the time and I was looking for new games to fill up my PSP library. I had never heard of Monster Hunter before, but the cover art caught my eye. It was a man holding a giant bone sword fighting what looked to be a conventional dragon, or wyvern, I never really knew the difference. The concept sounded simple, but interesting enough and I decided to pick it up. The game demanded a certain level of commitment and learning that I wasn't looking to put into a series at the time. The battle system was confusing to me and felt slow and sluggish. I found myself with barely any weapons, items, or money, and no real understanding about how I was supposed to progress. I didn't get it. I think it was maybe a week later that I traded the game in. It wouldn't be until the release of Freedom Unite in 2009 that I gave the series another go. I had memories of playing Freedom and felt like I missed something. Maybe the concept appealed more to me now that I was a bit older, but I'm not sure. I had a more accepting attitude of the premise. In fact, it sounded really appealing to hunt monsters in order to progress, rather than your traditional action RPG leveling system. Again, I didn't get very far. The game was still very demanding and lacked a certain quality of life standard that I expected from games at the time, something that is now appealing to me and the cult following the game received in the West. I still had a hard time progressing, figuring out what weapon suited me best, and I probably hit a wall when I had to face a Tigrex in the Snowy Mountains area. Fast forward a year to 2010, and it was with the release of Monster Hunter Try that I really sank time into the series. Hours and hours of my day would go by hunting monsters. I think a big factor for me finally successfully getting hooked to the series was through having friends that played it with me. Through Freedom and Freedom Unite, I always tried to play the game solo, and that definitely isn't where the game is at its strongest. I'm laying out this backstory to convey how interested and invested I am in the series, as well as how inherently good the concept is. Even when the game was considered to be at its most inaccessible to a wider audience, it still had this pull in the back of my mind that made me want to return to try it again. Monster Hunter World has topped the charts, becoming Capcom's best-selling game of all time, with 15.7 million copies sold at the time of making this video. But what about the other games in the series? What led Monster Hunter to become the Capcom powerhouse it is today? And how did the series perform since its initial inception and release in 2004? In this multi-part video series, we'll take a look at all five generations of the Monster Hunter franchise, as well as Frontier, a Chinese MMO RPG series released on PC, and several spin-off games that have been developed. I'm Super Rad, and today I'm joined with Fly Ann to bring you a brief history of Monster Hunter, first generation. So let me paint a picture for you. It's 2001, and Network Play has been introduced to the PlayStation 2, which released a year prior. Your Capcom's Production Studio 1 division, and trying to figure out how to capitalize on the new functionality. An initiative is formed to create three games, with the goal of at least one of these games selling a million copies or more. These three games include Auto Modalista, Resident Evil Outbreak, and, you guessed it, Monster Hunter. Monster Hunter was produced by Tsuyoshi Tanaka and Noritaka Funamizu, but the development and production was taken over by Ryozo Sujimoto, who became the series producer since Monster Hunter Freedom 2. He has stated Monster Hunter to be the culmination of the work that went into the other two titles, as part of the Network Play initiative. Spoiler, both Monster Hunter and Resident Evil Outbreak ended up selling over a million copies in Japan, and this feat wouldn't happen in the West until the release of Monster Hunter 4 on the 3DS. The game was designed with cooperative play in mind, so players of any skill level could feel accomplished when hunting the giant creatures found in the series. Despite this angle, and the total sales reaching over 1 million copies, Monster Hunter still wasn't a big name in Japan, and wouldn't be until the release of Freedom 2 in 2007. So what's the game about? If you're an avid Monster Hunter fan, you probably already know the answer to this, but let's take a deeper look for those less familiar with the series. Monster Hunter is a hack and slash action strategy game that focuses on the hunting and capturing of large boss-like monsters. It promotes heavy preparation before each hunt by forcing the player to gather items around each of the game's hunting areas and use those items to craft beneficial items such as health potions or antidotes. To become more effective in the world of Monster Hunter, the player must use the items they carve off of the large monsters to forge and upgrade existing equipment, making the character more effective by raising their attack and defense. Monster Hunter introduces the following weapons, 
five blade master options the great sword sword and shield hammer and lance with dual blades being introduced later in the international edition and two gunner options the light bow gun and the heavy bow gun each of these weapons have their own strengths weaknesses and playing styles blade master and gunners also get their own armor sets in majority with some sets and armor pieces being shared between the two class archetypes weapons all have a specific sharpness level that can decrease through use while on a hunt a hunter must sharpen their weapon when it is in disrepair, or else suffer from lower damage and potentially bouncing off of the enemy instead of slicing or bashing into them. The maximum sharpness obtainable on a weapon in Monster Hunter 1 was green, with new sharpness levels being introduced in the expansion and in future games. Additionally, certain Blade Master weapons, such as the Long Sword, were better at damaging certain enemy parts or cutting off enemy tails, but more blunt weapons, like the Hammer, were more effective at knocking out the enemy and breaking through hard hides. Armor sets would also provide additional skill bonuses depending on the set, such as additional health or the ability to endure heat of the volcano area without items. The game introduced many of the iconic monsters that have persisted throughout the series. These include Gendrome, Iodrome, and Velocidrome, Basarios and Gravios, Cephadrome and Plesioth, Diablos and Monoblos, Yan Kutku and Gypsaros, Kezu, Rathian, and the game's flagship monster, Rathalos, possibly the most popular monster in the series. On top of these large monsters are several smaller monsters that the player will hunt and gather from along their quests and several Elder Dragons. Elder Dragons are a special class of large monsters that defy typical classifications of the standard monster and are exceptionally powerful. In Monster Hunter 1, these include Fatalis, Laoshan Lung, and Kirin. Kirin is the perfect example that the term Elder Dragon does not necessarily guarantee the creature will be of a dragon-like appearance. As of writing this, it is currently impossible to hunt both Kirin and Fatalis in the original game as they were online specific hunts and the servers have been shut down. Additionally, Elder Dragons cannot be captured like most larger monsters. The greater goal of the player is to complete quests that unlock higher ranks so that they can fight higher difficulty enemies and craft better gear. Quests in single player and multiplayer are separate, with multiplayer quests being set to a higher difficulty to match the possibility of multiple hunters on a mission. The single player or village quests consist of one star to five star, while the multiplayer or town quests go up to six star. Town quests are broken up into low rank, which is up to three star, and high rank from four star and up. High rank quests introduce new monsters and armor sets, as well as more powerful versions of previously introduced monsters. Completing quests in the original game provided the player with hunter rank points, or HR points for short. It would take certain amounts of HR points for the player to eventually advance up through 20 hunter ranks, starting as a ranger and eventually reaching the title of monster hunter. The hunter rank determines what quests the player can participate in, as well as what is sold in the local shops. The hub world the player spends most of their time in is Kokoto Village, where they can shop, forge, upgrade, and eat before posting quests and heading out on hunts. This is where all offline content takes place within the first generation. The village has a landmark called the Hero's Blade, which is embedded in a large rock. The blade belonged to a legendary hunter who hunted a monoblos and the elder dragon Lao Shan Lung single-handedly before hunting a second Lao Shan Lung due to it killing his fiance. This hunter is referred to as the hero of Kokoto. The online town quest took place in Mineguard Town, a special location only seen in the original Monster Hunter and the expansion Monster Hunter G. Mineguard consisted of the central square, an armory where the player could forge equipment, and the tavern. The tavern was where players would interact the most, being able to post quests, get virtually drunk, and chat. The tavern reappears in Monster Hunter Freedom, but is located in Kokoto Village. Other locations in Mineguard Town include the guest house, where players could rent rooms based on their hunter rank. Here the player could change their gear, eat for kitchen or feline skills, and save their game. Finally, Mineguard Town also included a market where players could visit various shops to buy goods and get daily special sales. On each server, up to 8 players could enter the town at any given time, but only up to 4 players could participate in a quest together. The original Monster Hunter introduced eight unique hunting and exploration slash gathering locations. These included forest and hills, jungle, desert, swamp, and volcano. Additionally, there were two special boss areas, the fortress and castle Scrade, as well as an arena. 
The fortress is a special location where the hunters can fight Lao Shan Lung and later Shen Gao Ren in Monster Hunter 2. The castle area was used specifically to fight the Elder Dragon Fatalis. A player would have to pay different contract fees of various amounts of the in-game currency Zenny to unlock additional areas and weapons of the castle to help in the battle. Poogie is an iconic pet to the player and has appeared in every Monster Hunter to date. In Monster Hunter 1, the player could interact with Poogie, but wouldn't be able to dress him up in costumes until Monster Hunter 2. The player can interact with Poogie and play a short, time-based minigame to pet the Poogie's head and have it follow them around. There is a long-standing rumor that petting the Poogie properly will raise the hunter's luck and helps with getting rare items from carving large monsters on hunts. This has never been proven to be true, and I want to make that very clear because this is one of the oldest rumors in the series. It is unproven that petting the poogie does anything to raise drop rates. But is that going to stop you from petting him anyway? Monster Hunter was released internationally and included several differences compared to its Japanese counterpart, specifically the inclusion of dual blades, which did not appear in the Japanese release. The variety of this weapon type was small and were integrated into the sword and shield crafting paths instead of their own unique path. Other changes include seeing equipped weapons outside of a quest, the addition of an auto-sort function for the inventory, something that has persisted throughout the rest of the series, and the addition of the iconic kill screen, which shows the player's perspective during the last hit of an enemy encounter that killed it and completed the quest, as well as multiple other small changes. Now with all that out of the way, let's have Fly Ann explain all of the additional content found in the expansion game, Monster Hunter G. Monster Hunter G is a Japan-exclusive game released on the PlayStation 2 in 2005, and later on the Nintendo Wii in 2009. It is considered an expansion of the original Monster Hunter, consisting of all the content from the main game as well as several new additions. Before we get into the content, let's discuss the name. Why G? What does adding a letter signify to the player? There's a lot of discussion you can find online about the G title, but the easiest way to think about it is to think about how Western culture might add words like super or ultimate to their titles when definitive editions are released. In fact, when Monster Hunter 3 G made it over to the West, it was renamed to Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate. The general consensus you'll find online is that G stands for great or that it conveys a certain energy of something being bigger or better. MHG introduced a lot of new content, including concepts that would last throughout the entire series. One of these was subspecies. Certain monsters within the series received new variations that while generally looking fairly similar to one another, could have multiple changes, such as elemental type, weaknesses, moves, and drops. These subspecies included Black Gravios and Blue Yan Kutku, Green Plesioth, that son of a bitch, and Purple Gypsaros, Red Kezu, Black Diablos and White Monoblos, Pink Rathian and Gold Rathian, Azure Rathalos, who ended up being the flagship monster for the Western release of Three Ultimate, and Silver Rathalos, and the Elder Dragons Ashen Lao Shan Lung and Crimson Fatalis. With new monsters came new armor sets and weapons, and with new weapons came two new sharpness levels introduced to the series. Where the previous highest sharpness level was green, now players could work towards blue and further into white sharpness. These sharpness levels provided significantly higher raw damage multipliers. g rank quests were introduced to the game. These quests would appear after the hunter successfully completed high rank, and would offer more difficult challenges as well as a new tier of weapons and armor sets. Something that is persistent in both Monster Hunter for the PS2 and Monster Hunter G is the control style. This style changes in freedom, but in the original PS2 releases, had the player attacking with the right analog stick and moving the camera with the D-pad. This led to a popularized form of holding the controller called the claw grip. This form of holding the controller was even used by the developers of the game. With future releases of the game and the inclusion of multiple control schemes, the claw grip soon became obsolete. In 2009, a version of Monster Hunter G was ported to the Nintendo Wii. The re-release included a special classic controller for the game, as well as a demo for Monster Hunter Tri. There are a few differences to go over, specifically the control scheme, which was based on the freedom slash portable version of the game rather than the PS2 version. The game also added movesets and handling from the second generation of games without the inclusion of second generation weapons. An example of this being in the Greatsword Charge. Having come out after the second generation of games, it included a few quality of life changes, such as the hunter starting with one of each weapon type at their base forms 
as well as the ability to preview weapons before crafting them. Monster Hunter Portable could be considered a mobile port of G, with very few variations or changes. There are multiple to discuss, however, but nothing as drastic as the additions added to G. For example, only one new monster is introduced to the series, that being Yan Garuga, a relative of Yan Kutku and a monster that functioned in the game similarly to Elder Dragons from the later generations, needing to be repelled multiple times. Subspecies previously were only available in town quests, now called guild quests, but now also appeared in village quests. The player wouldn't know if they were hunting a subspecies unless the quest specifically mentioned the color of the monster in the quest description. The game also introduced a multiplayer-only treasure hunt mode, where two players could take on a gathering quest and be rewarded with money by completing it. Arguably the biggest addition to the game was the Kokoto Farm, an addition where players could gather materials without going out on quests and into field areas. Like zones and quest fields, they have limited amounts of resources that would only refresh in between quests. The player can purchase renovations as they progress through the game that would allow them to gather better materials. The player would have to first unlock these renovations through urgent quests, and then purchase them using Kokoto points, which are obtained by buying and selling materials in the village. The training school was also introduced, which allowed players to learn how to play the game and hone their skills, as well as certain challenges the players could partake in. It's rather bare bones in Freedom, and is expanded on in future games. No new sharpness was introduced in the Freedom version of the game, however white sharpness was nerfed. In G, the raw damage multiplier for white sharpness is 1.5, and is brought down to 1.3 for the portable game. And that's it for the first generation of Monster Hunter. I'd like to thank Flyan for joining me in this video. You can find him over on the following. Links are also in the description. Be sure to check out his Poke Hunter series where he draws hunters equipped with Pokemon inspired armor and weapons. Additionally, a big shout out to the Monster Hunter Gathering Hall Discord for offering clarification on certain topics, such as the inclusion of Yan Garuga in Freedom, as well as general lore knowledge that they didn't possess before and will help for future videos. You can find a link to that Discord in the description as well. In the next video, we will be focusing on the second generation of Monster Hunter, including Monster Hunter Dose, Freedom 2, and Freedom Unite which really helped to popularize the series in Japan. See you then. Hello. Hello, it's me. I I make I made this. I made this video. Um I'm super rad. I have a couple extra topics to go over or just some clarifications of stuff that got brought up in the video. So, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to I'm going to read it and you're going to you're going to be like that thing I was about to call you out on. I oh, he brought it up here at the end. Okay. So it's not it's not as bad. So, first of all, small monsters in the in Monster Hunter 1 in the PS2, which is what I I played most of it myself. Uh they're awful. They're they're terrible. In newer games, they kind of just like they vibe a little bit and will attack you, but not to the consistency. I mean, you might be able to see it in some of the some of the footage that I made. I you can't carve. You have you have to clear it out if you want to be able to carve without uh, any real issues. They are just they are just so awful. So yeah, there, there's that. The claw grip stuff on the PSP, I ended up writing it like it w went away after Monster Hunter a G on the PS2, but that's not true. I, the PSP actually didn't even have a right analog stick. So while the control scheme did change, claw grip was still like a viable option uh, within that game. You still like, you still like held it kind of like, kind of like this and moved the camera. Getting the quest you want is tough. The amount of times I had to go into a quest and abandon it so that I could go back and see if one of the monsters I needed to record was now an option was astronomical. Each of the ranks gives you five options. It could The game could only fit in five options and those options kind of like randomly cycle through or maybe random, I'm not sure, I think random. Uh, but they would cycle through every time you would go into a quest and come back. So I had to go into a quest, abandon it, and come back out, which was awful. 
Uh, I didn't mention him in this video, but there is a legendary gunner uh, on top of the hero of Kokoto. There is a legendary gunner. He actually gives you, I believe, a quest to hunt a monoblos. I believe it's to hunt a monoblos. And he kind of just shows up so at some point. He kind of shows up at some point late into the game and just... Uh, and just hangs out under the tree near where you would like go off to go do your quests. So yeah, he's there, the legendary gunner. He's pretty cool. Finally, I said that uh, it is impossible to play this game online and like visit Mineguard Town. That's that's technically not true. I believe through emulation and like either through an emulator or modding your PS2 that you could like go into somebody's private server if they're hosting one. I think and play it through that and that means that you could technically access mind guard town and you could technically access kirin and fatalis but i wasn't i didn't want to do that and i didn't do that and again thank you to flyan for appearing in this video okay